of Moses built the tent. Thank you. Good morning. It's good to see each one of you. I've been looking forward to being here. This is almost like coming home to me. I was born in Franklin County, Ohio. I always enjoy coming back and being with you fine folks. Appreciate the invitation that Greg has extended for me to talk about this topic and for the congregation here for hosting the lectureship. I know a lot of work goes into this kind of event. And you plan and you plan and you plan and you hope people will come. And so I know the congregation here, the leadership here appreciates you coming and being a part of the lectureship. This year's theme is about patterns and my subject is Moses built the tent. Now I want to start with, it's a little long quote so I broke it out over three slides. But I want to talk about, you know, we have had warnings. Warnings that have gone unheeded. And I just want to give you, I always remember this statement the first time I ever read it, which was original, when it first came out, I mean. And so when Greg asked me to do this topic, I immediately thought of this statement. And I want to take the time to read it to you. And hopefully you can see it on the screen. Well, I tried to, I had to break it apart just so you'd be able to see it. But this is from Global Music's Behold the Pattern. It certainly would be most difficult for me to understand that God gave the people in Old Testament times so many patterns. Noah was given a pattern for the ark. Moses was given a pattern for the tabernacle. David and Solomon were given a pattern for the temple, etc. Yea, and instructed them in so many and variegated items. But when it came to us who live in New Testament times, that he just left us to be on our own. Can anyone truly believe that today the people of God are completely patternless? Thanks be to God that he did not do any such thing. Cry if you like, but we do have a divine design. Whether you call or term it a figure, a form, model, plan, order, criterion, blueprint, yardstick, rule book, guide, mold, measure, example, etc., etc., that is precisely what it is. Indeed, the New Testament is the pattern. We must be absolutely diligent in walking in the footsteps of the Master, 1 Peter 2.21. If we do not emulate the New Testament pattern, we will be just like those we read about in Judges 17.6, 21.25. That is, we too can just do that which is right in our own eyes. We know today that is exactly what is happening among us, as so many are dead set against a norm, a standard, yea, against rule and regulations. That's 1991. And this is just one example of a warning that's given. I always find it sad When you come across people, and some of them are occupying our pulpits, that say that there's no such thing as a pattern in the New Testament. I wonder sometimes what New Testament they're reading. According to the pattern, just look at these two passages side by side. And ask yourself, is there a pattern or not? But there, how much more plain would it have to be? Notice in Exodus 25, 8 through 9, And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them according to all that I show you, that is, the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furnishings, just so you shall make it. Notice the word pattern there. And then in Hebrews chapter 8, 4 and 5, For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things, 
as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, See that you make all things according to the pattern show you on, shown you on the mountain. Now, can there be really any doubt that God uses patterns? There really cannot be. Well, in this lecture, I, I usually try to keep it sort of in the lecture kind of format. But I want us to talk about three points. Hopefully we can get them all in. We'll talk about the tabernacle pattern, and then we'll talk about tests to the pattern, and then the pattern of teaching. And I apologize if I tread on some people's material. Hopefully I do not do that. But just chalk it up through repetition and not redundancy. First of all, the tabernacle pattern. If you would, open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 25. That's really where we start. And unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to read very much of all these things, but I'll try to put some screen shots up to just sort of refresh your memory. But I would like to read Exodus 25, 1 and 2. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them according to all that I show you that is the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furnishings, just so you shall make it. He's given them instructions. You know, the interesting thing, they're at Mount Sinai. And it takes pretty much, it takes a lot of text in Exodus to get the tabernacle design given, built, and verified. And one of the reasons that it does that is because the Israelites involve themselves with sin. You ever notice how sin just disrupts what God is trying to accomplish for us? It's just disruptive. So it actually takes quite a bit of text to get all that through. But let's just look at the tabernacle pattern. Now this is a picture of the whole courtyard. The tabernacle itself is actually that smaller rectangular in the middle there. The tabernacle footprint was roughly 150 feet long by 70 feet wide, 75 feet wide. It faced, the opening faced to the east. It, it was surrounded by a courtyard fence. And I'll give you, there's the dimensions. These are based on the definition of a cubit. But I mentioned, you know, he gives the instructions, or the instructions are given multiple times in Exodus. For example, he gives the details in Exodus 27. The details are followed by the builders in Exodus 38, and Moses inspects them in Exodus 40. And sometimes people wonder, well, why, why, does, why does God give the same instructions over and over and over again? I don't know exactly why, but I wonder if that's so when it says that Moses did all according to he, that he was instructed. There's no doubt he did all of it. And it's my personal opinion that's written there so we understand we have to do all of it, not just part of it. Not just the part that we like. The fence was seven and a half feet high, had an area, covered an area of about 11,250 square feet. There was a gate there. The gate was made of bronze and there's additional detail there. He gives uh, detail about it in Exodus 27, 16, and then also in verse 38, they build it. And then in chapter 40, Moses inspects it. Now, if we go in and we look at, uh, the next thing is the bronze altar. These are where the sacrifices were made. You know, there's a lot more patterns than I'm going to be able to talk about in this lecture. Greg picked Moses built the tent. But you know what? God designed the sacrifices. God designed the, the feast days. God designed all those things in great detail. The altar would be there uh, as you came into the gate, and there's the dimensions of it. And I'm not going to read all the places where 
Moses was given the instructions and the builders followed the instructions and Moses made sure the instructions were followed. You can read about that. Every once in a while I come across uh, the, uh, the question, how do we, you know, what do we need to teach our young people? I don't know about what your answer to that is, and that's a, that's a complex question. But I can tell you just from my own personal experience, we at one point lived, when I was a young person getting ready to become a teenager, we lived, we lived in New Philadelphia, Ohio, and we used gospel treasures. And we used gospel treasures, and it was covering Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. Well, we moved. My dad was a preacher, and you know how preachers are, sometimes they move. Well, we moved to Weirton, West Virginia. And guess what we were covering there? The same book that I just finished covering. Gospel Treasures, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. We were there for about two years. Then we moved to Centralia, Illinois. Now, I became a teenager in Weirton, I'm about ready to enter high school when we moved to Centralia. And guess what book they were using? Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. You know what I came away from that study? God gave us instructions that he expects us to obey. What are we trying to get across to our young people? Among other things, we should be trying to get them to understand the Word of God is God's Word. And it needs to be respected as that. If you do, I'll tell you what, if you do Gospel Treasures in Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers three times in a row, you don't need to do it that many times to get that point across. But I remember that. He had instructions here about the bronze altar. You go on, you come to the bronze laver that was built. Here they would do their ceremonial washings. Uh, the priests would do, and you can see it pointed out there. Now, as we move to the right there, the tabernacle, we actually come to the tabernacle itself. It was a physical structure designed, as we look at this blueprint here, and one person wrote about it. It says, physically, the tabernacle was a tripartite. I don't know if I'm saying that right or not. Probably not. But basically, it's a series of tents. One entering the outer court could proceed directly forward to the holy place and then the most holy place. The holy of holies was directly behind the holy place. Now, the interesting thing that I came across a source that made a really good point. It talked about, remember that passage we just read about that God would dwell among them? It's not uncommon that you'll come across readings where we'll talk about, well, the other, you know, the other heathen nations, they had their places of worship and all that, and they had, they had built a house for their false gods, and they actually crafted their false god out of wood or whatever, and they actually set them there. And their false god lived in that house that they built him. But that's not the tabernacle. The tabernacle is a meeting place. It's where God would meet them. He didn't live in it. A big difference there. We serve a living God, not one crafted by our hands and our imagination. The dimensions of the tabernacle... Uh, were 15 by 45 feet. The holy place was 15 by 30 feet. The most holy place was 15 by 15. You go on, you see the lamp stand. They had to have light. We're not exactly sure of the dimensions. Some Jewish sources state that it was about five feet tall and about three and a half feet wide. You had to have light. Light's important. You doubt that? Just sit in the dark for a while. It's important. God knows that. You go on, you'll see the table of the showbread. And the dimensions are given there, and the fact that it was six loaves with two stacks each of unleavened bread, one for each tribe. And the position where it is at. And then you come across the veil there. The veil, and I, you know, I would really like to see the veil sometime. I don't know if God will let us do that or not. But I just wonder how it looked. 
15 feet long and 15 feet tall. You know, one of the things I think about that 15 feet tall is that, uh, although it wasn't probably this one, but 15 feet tall, that's awful hard to rip from the top to the bottom, isn't it? The veil divided the holy place from the most holy place. Then you have the altar of the incense, where they burned incense, and it was important. And they had a special formulation for that incense. They just couldn't go out and grab, and I don't know anything about incense. I probably should have looked up a whole bunch of them little sticks you can get, so I could refer to you to the proper name of all those brands of incense sticks. I, I really just, and if you burn it, it's okay. I just can't hardly stand incense. It just, it's just not my thing. But God gave them specific ingredients and formulation for it. God expected them to follow that. And they weren't just allowed to use that wherever they wanted to. It was to be consecrated for the service at the altar of the incense. So you have that and the measurements there are provided for that. And then of course you have you know, the, the piece of furniture that everybody likes to talk about, uh, the Ark of the Covenant. It was 45 inches long, 27 inches wide, 27 inches tall. We know that it had the pot of, a pot of manna in it. We know that it had Aaron's rod in it. And we know that it had the tables of the covenant in it. And you might say, well, how do you know that? Well, that's Hebrews 9.4. You don't have to go around and say, I sort of wonder what they kept in that box. It tells us. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 4, that was the contents of what they had in there. One of the things that, you know, when I did a study about the tabernacle that really sort of impressed me about it was how, how beautiful it had to be. And wouldn't you like to, I mean, some of you have seen replicas. I haven't, but I know at Polish in the pulpit they've had one. I haven't seen that. But just reading, you know, and you use your imagination and all the bronze and the silver and the colors and the, and the ornateness of it, it just had to be really beautiful. You know, God loves things of beauty. He loves things of beauty. I did a little calculation on how much it would cost to make the tabernacle. Now, these are, this is just an estimate. Sometimes you read estimates and you know, and I, and I turn and I look at my estimates and the resources I have, and I have books back from 1951. Well, the price of gold in 1951 is a little different than the price of gold today. So I was like, well, you know, I'd sort of like to get an idea of what that is. So I, I made some assumptions. I assumed that a talent uh, equals 3,000 shekels. I assumed the shekel weighs 0.3646 of a troy ounce. I assume the market rate of gold, which I looked that up, and the market rate of silver, and the market rate of bronze, and I did the math and the calculation of it, and I came up with a figure of $40 million. And that's just the precious metals. That's a lot of money. Now, how would, a, how would a bunch of slave people, they've been in slavery for, you know, for what? For a long time, right? How in the world would they get that kind of money or that, those kind of materials? Is, is, God, is God so cruel? Is he so exacting on us that he expects us to do what we are not able to do? And I think about this. Where did they get all these precious materials? God gave it to them. God gave it to them. You can read about that in Exodus chapter 3, 20 through 22, and chapter 12, verse 36. God provided them these things, and they had the opportunity to now give back to God what God had given them. And they did so generously. So much so that the builders come back to Moses and say, you know what? Tell them to stop. We have way too much. Stop, stop, stop. How, how would it be, you know, when's the last time an eldership had to tell a congregation to stop giving because you, you've given too much money? I'm not saying that hasn't happened, but 
But God provided that to them. God provides us blessings. We need to be careful not to allow our minds to get into the idea that it's ours, it's mine. It's mine. We need to remember God gives, he provides. We're stewards of it. We're not gonna have it for a little bit of time anyway. We need to make sure that we're good stewards of what God has given us. He gave to them, they gave back to him, and they were recorded as an example for their faithfulness to that, which wasn't that long ago where their unfaithfulness had occurred with the calf, the golden calf. So we need to remember that. Now the tabernacle pattern, you may, you may see a chart and I have three slides. On mine, it's one piece of paper, and it's really hard for me to see. So I, I divided it up into three slides. But there's no doubt there's, there's shadows and imagery there, foreshadowing, types, antitypes there. And you may see things like these. And you may have thought of these yourself or remember them. Uh, the altar of burnt offering, the sacrifice for sins. Jesus was crucified outside the gate. Or the bronze labor was for cleansing. Your baptism washes away our sins. You just, you, know, you just couldn't go into the holy place as a priest. You just couldn't go in there. You, you had to cleanse yourself of the bronze altar first. You just couldn't just walk on in. If we're heading and we're wanting to be in the presence of God, we need to cleanse ourselves of our sins through his plan. I had Everett Hufford for um, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. I didn't have enough of it. I had to take a college class on it too at Free Harding University. Everett Hufford taught the class and it was really early in the morning. I think it was, I don't know if it was 7.30 in the morning, and it's just about all I could do to stay awake sometimes. That's early. If you stay up till midnight playing cards. And I remember asking him a question. I said, Brother Hufford, all these sacrifices that were made, you keep talking about these shadows, of fortune. What, what, you know, how are all these sacrifices fulfilled? And he didn't hesitate for one second. He said, they are all fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is all of those sacrifices he made for us. The next one talks about um, the holy place, the golden lampstand. You know, I can't help but thinking about light to see what you're doing, where you're going, what you're supposed to be about. And I think about God's word is a lamp. It provides us illumination. Or the table of showbread, the memorial of Jesus' life and death. Or the altar of incense, the service and worship of the Christian. This area here to me describes the church. But as we come through that gate and we come to those labor and, the, and we go into the holy place, we seek to go to the most holy place. Well, let's take a look at the images there of the most holy place. It talks about being in the presence of God. That veil of separation has been removed we're going to have to die. The most holy place is the presence of God. That's heaven. We are going to pass through that veil. And the Ark of Covenant is the promises, and we have the promise of God's grace and his mercy. There, there's patterns there. There's patterns there. And as I mentioned, those aren't the only patterns. We could also talk about, you know, God specified how the priests were to dress what their attire was supposed to be. He tells them that. He also even went so far, if you go into the book of Numbers, he talks about how they were supposed to be encamped around the tabernacle. 
He tells them that. Now who can imagine that they didn't have a pattern? Now you would think that God is so specific about that that you would have people that would want to follow that. And they wouldn't want to deviate from that at all. Well, point number two, test to the pattern. In Numbers 1, 51, it says, And when the tabernacle is to go forward, the Levite shall take it down. And when the tabernacle is to be set up, the Levite shall set it up. The outsider who comes near shall be put to death. You think God's serious about that? He repeats that kind of warning in Numbers 3.10, Numbers 3.38, and 18.7. There's another warning given. Let me read you this one. Exodus 30.19-21 For Aaron and his son shall wash their hands and their feet in water from it. When they go into the tabernacle of meeting, or when they come near the altar to minister, to burn an offering made by fire to the Lord, they shall wash with water lest they die. So they shall wash their hands and their feet, lest they die. Do you think God is serious about that? How would, he, how would he make it any more clear than that? Well, the first test of the pattern I want us to take a look at is Nadab and Abihu. Who were they? They were the sons of Aaron. What did they do? You can read about it in Leviticus chapter 10. 1 through 7, they offered profane fire. Or if you like the English Standard Version, I think I believe that uses unauthorized. Unauthorized. Now, if God, if God, didn't he just tell them, you know, does he have to tell them, if you do this, you'll die. If you do that, you'll die. If you do this, you'll die. If you do, he tells them, you know, it's really serious. He expects them to follow that. And what happens? They violate it. And what happens to them? They're struck dead because of it. They didn't obey the pattern. They deviated from that pattern. It's interesting in the account of that. Aaron's probably initial reaction was that of a father. It was, it was his, one was his firstborn child. Probably the other was the second oldest. I imagine that Aaron was probably really, really upset. And I don't know if Moses and Aaron had a conversation about it. But Aaron got to the point where it says, you know, it says, God says, my name will be glorified. And it says, Aaron held his peace. Why did he do that? I believe it's because he recognized that God had stipulated his will and his sons, even though he loved them, had violated it. And he held his peace because you couldn't blame God for it. But how many people, they don't do that. They blame God. So the pattern was put to the test and the pattern was enforced. And we need to be aware of those people today who want to put the Lord's pattern for the church to test today. Because they're out there, all over the place. The second one we'll look at is Uzzah touches the Ark of the Covenant. They read through that, you know, and they, they have that Ark on a cart, and they're driving along, riding along, and, you know, in a cart, you know, it's sort of, it's probably going through Cuyahoga County, hit a big old pothole. And we got a zillion of them there in Cuyahoga County, where I live. And it stumbles and all that, and and the ark is, you know, it's become, and Uzzah just reaches out, and he, he did a noble thing, right? And he didn't want the ark to fall off that cart, right? And the Lord struck him dead. Wait a minute. You remember, it was never supposed to be on a cart.
David, King David even gets upset for a little bit there. But eventually he learned. Incidentally, the account is in 2 Samuel 6, 1 through 11, but I'd like to read what uh, 1 Chronicles 15, 12 through 13. David finally learns if, you know, he was supposed to copy down a copy of the law of himself, right, as king. And th that was one of the things he was supposed to do. So they wouldn't do what actually happened. He had to go find out what he did wrong. And guess what? It was written in a document that he didn't pay attention to. He says, you are the heads of the father's houses of the Levites. Sanctify yourselves, you and your brethren, that you may bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel to the place I have prepared it. For because you did not do it the first time, the Lord our God broke out against us because we did not consult him about the proper order. Again, the test to the pattern is made and the pattern is enforced. Do we learn the lesson or not from that? Third point is the, the pattern of teaching. And what I want to do is I want to bring up a definition here for the word pattern in the New Testament. This is from a popular Greek lexicon. It's highly respected, not published by the church. But I want you to take a look at Hopefully you can read that. I put in yellow the words I want you to focus on. This is the Greek word that we get in our English translations for pattern. And what I would like to do over just, you know, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them, but I want to bring up some of the passages where this term shows up in the New Testament. And I really want you to think about how could anybody deny that the New Testament is a pattern? First one's John 20, 25. The other disciples therefore said to him, we have seen the Lord. So he said to them, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Remember that definition there, that first one, you know, had that idea of a, a, an imprint. Sort of like how I learned how to type on a typewriter. I know, you had to probably go to the Smithsonian and see those typewriters now. If you're lucky, they still have them. I learned on an IBM Select Right electric typewriter, and that was considered high technology when I learned it. And it had that element ball. And I looked at that little element. It was just like a ball. I mean, it was like a ping pong ball, except it was metal. And it had all these different characters on it and shapes and all that and everything. And, and it had this ribbon. And whenever I hit the key, that ball, even though I couldn't really see it, it would spin around and position itself and strike the ribbon. And that ribbon and that ball would hit the paper and it would leave a mark, a pattern, an imprint. This is that word. It's that precise. Well, let's take a look at Romans 6, 27. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. That form of doctrine, the gospel. And be very careful about statements that when people say, you know, uh, I'm really tired of hearing about doctrine. We need to talk about the gospel. You know what they've done when they make those kinds of statements? And I've seen them, some of those statements. You know what they've done? They've just revealed that they don't know what doctrine means. That's what they've done. Doctrine is just teaching. That's what it is. It's not some encrypted code word. We don't want to have anything to do with doctrine. Well, okay. That form of doctrine. You may want to remember that passage when you hear somebody make a statement like that because believe me, it will be made. Or this one, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 6. Now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. I'm not going to quote this person. I, I could probably do it, but I'm not going to. 
and I know who it is, and I know where it's found, but you may have come across a statement where someone said, what kind of church do you want to restore? The church of Colossae, the church of Laodicea, you, you probably remember that statement, some of you might remember. And the point, or Corinth, and the, the person's real popular uh, the, at the time, the person would go on to say, you know, it's just silly that you would want, look at those churches as a pattern. The person fails to respect, because I believe they know better, that God teaches in a variety of ways. He tells us in the book of Hebrews not to make the same mistakes that the Israelites made that resulted in the wandering of the wilderness. Do not follow that example of unbelief. Do not follow that pattern of unbelief. You know, some people, they just, oh yeah, you know what? Corinth was a, it was a church that had sin in it. And so, you know, we just can't really learn anything from that. Really? Better check again. But yet you'll have people use that kind of argument. Or Philippians 3, 16 through 18. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind, brethren, join in following my example, and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. For many walk, of whom I have told you often and now tell you, even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. You know, we have people today, they'll say, you know what? I don't care what the Apostle Paul says. Well, they better care. They better care if they're going to follow the pattern. And if they're not going to follow the pattern, they're putting the pattern to the test, right? If they're putting the pattern to the test, what do you think is going to happen to them? Careful. Let's go on. 1 Timothy 1, 16. However, for this reason I obtain mercy that in me, first Jesus Christ, might show all long-suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Precious passage. God's long-suffering. Or 2 Timothy 1, 13. Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. And this, is, this is one of my favorite passages when I have to debate with people whether on social media. You know, some people say well, it's worthless to debate with people on social media. And, you know, we can debate about that later if we want to. But uh, to me, you know, I can't debate with them in person, so I'm going to let them have it on social media. And when they say things like the New Testament, it, there's no pattern in the New Testament. This is the first passage I pop up. I don't even have to comment on it. I just copy the verse and the citation. To say there's no pattern in the New Testament is absurd. Let's go on. Titus chapter 2, 6 through 8. Likewise, exhort the young men to be sober-minded in all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works and doctrine, showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that one who is an opponent might be ashamed, having nothing evil to say to you. You know, we're not just supposed to be a pattern as far as the church. We are supposed to follow the pattern ourselves as Christians. Hebrews chapter 7, 12 through 14. For the priesthood being changed a necessity, there is also a change of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe, for which no man has officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. Now, I have the, you know, the pattern you can see, but I want to point out that last phrase there. How many people, have you, how many times you've heard people say that silence of the scriptures is not a valid argument in establishing Bible authority? You can't prove anything about the silence of the scriptures. 
And I just, it just sort of baffles me. I'm like, have you? And so I, I could just see Jesus almost, you know, when he said, have you not read? Have you not read? Have you not read Hebrews 7, 12 through 14, of which tribe Moses spoke? Nothing. That is an argument of silence. And you know what God did? He changed the law. That's why we're not under the Old Testament. He established a New Testament. And we need to remember that. And don't forget, God is the one that changed the law. Not man. Not man. Things that we need to remember. Hebrews chapter 8, 4 through 6. For if he were on earth, he would not be priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, See that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, inasmuch as he is a mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. There's a clear connection. It's a clear connection that we better not ignore. So, as we sort of review our three points, there's a pattern in the building of the tabernacle. Moses built the tent according to the pattern. There were people in the Old Testament, they test the pattern. I want to give you two examples. There were others. There were others that thought that they could test it and found out wrong. And there is a pattern of teaching. You know, we've heard a lot about people saying, you know, uh, we're just not content with pattern theology. We need to have a new hermeneutic. Heard a lot about that? New hermeneutic. That's, that was one of the reasons I believe that prompted Global Music to write that book. And people were saying, you know, uh, we need a new hermeneutic. You know, they don't really have one. They just like to complain against command, example, and implication. You know, what we refer to as pattern. They don't have one themselves, exactly. They just like to complain about the old. And, you know, given time, we could see the consequence of that. Let me just put up a statement here to show you where the new hermeneutic leads. The idea that we don't have a pattern. This is written by this group's own words. I just took out their names. But you can find it easy enough if you're really that curious. A new egalitarian church plant in Nashville called All Saints Church of Christ established October 7th, 2016 Church planners include, we meet at 4 p.m. on Sunday in the sanctuary of the Vine Street Christian Church. Our services are liturgical and we follow the revised common lectionary and church calendar. Home to a large number of Masters of Divinity students and theological, theology, theology professors, we rotate male and female preachers, communion officiants, and worship leaders each week. Our worship is a blend of a cappella and instrumental depending on who's leading. And we get to experience both male and female members offering prayers and reading scripture. We have no official elders or deacons at this point and instead are practicing liturgy without hierarchy. Our goal is that everyone may serve according to his or her giftedness and that the priesthood of all believers would be both theology and lived practice. Each week, 100% of our contribution goes to a different faith-based charity. As we have no paid staff, and no overhead costs. That is where the new hermeneutic leads. The people ignored the warning. In conclusion, I want you to think about this statement from that quote. We are practicing liturgy, uh, liturgy excuse me, without hierarchy. Without hierarchy. That's a true statement. Because Christ is the head of the church. And it's his word. And that's the pattern we need to follow. Thank you very much for your time.